today. And we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's continue in our worship by hearing the scriptures this morning from our passage in Romans chapter 8, verses 18 through 25. Romans 8, 18 through 25. This is God's word to each of you today. The Apostle Paul writes, Yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. For all creation is waiting eagerly for the future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from sin and from suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. If we already had something, we don't need to hope for it. But if we look forward to something we don't yet have, we must wait patiently and confidently. This is God's word to you today. You can be seated. Thank you, guys. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. My name is Chris. I'm one of the pastors here at New City. And I just want to add my word of welcome to Innocent. Thank you for being with us this morning. And just to connect some dots here, a few weeks ago, we hosted Compassion International as a a new partner for us and our global ministry, specifically in East Africa, the countries of Rwanda and Uganda, Ethiopia and Kenya. And so it's a privilege, in a sense, to be partnering with you and Progressive Ministries and your important work in Uganda. And as you heard Innocent say, he himself was a Compassion-sponsored child. And so for those of you, over 400 of you that sponsored a child and are continuing to do so through compassion, thank you. And Innocent is a a walking, living testimony to the ministry of compassion and the furtherance of that ministry in the countries of origin for each of these children. And we're so proud of you and the ministry of Progressive and we're proud to be able to be your sponsor. We're humbled to be able to, to, to work with you and to participate in your mission Uh, Thank you for letting us join you in what you're doing in Uganda. We're grateful for that. Thanks for being here. And as Travis mentioned, um, we have a lunch this afternoon at 1230. So if you're looking for a free lunch, you're welcome to come back uh, here today. We're going to be in the academy room, which is just over here to the right in W2 and 3 at 1230. And we'll have an hour and a half to hear more about Progressive Ministries. And Travis will also be sharing a little bit more about our global strategy uh, and, and how all this fits in together for the work of New City around the world. I also want to just say thank you before we jump into our passage for last week. As we celebrated the resurrection together, I want to thank each of you for um, your participation in our mission at New City of helping people find and follow Jesus, which is just our way of talking about the Great Commission, what Jesus gave for us to do until he returns. We had more people on our campus for Easter than we've ever had in the history of our church. And it's because of two things. It's because you're in, in investing and you're inviting people in your circles of influence. And the Bible talks about this, that you know, we're meant to be a witness to people and our, the word in the Greek is oikos, which is a fancy way or word of just talking about your circle of influence or your household, which is not just your blood relatives, but the people that you run into every day, that you work with, that you're your neighbors. And as Jesus said in the Great Commission, you know, go into all the world, make disciples. The phrase there is actually, as you were going into the world make disciples. So in other words, as you go about your daily life, as you go to your favorite coffee shop, as you talk at the end of your driveway with your neighbors, as you go to work tomorrow, you're meant to be making disciples in your circles. And and you guys are doing that. I just want to encourage you as your pastor to continue to make disciples as you go into the world in your circles. And also specifically, you made space for people to be here. Uh, This wouldn't have happened, what happened last week, if you hadn't made space for people to come and to be here. So thank you for your sacrifice, and it was a great celebration. And for those of you who are uh, back for the second time, a special welcome to you, and we're so glad to have you a part of New City Church. And with that, we've been studying the book of Romans. 
And we're going to continue today, and actually we're going to be continuing all throughout the summer. We'll finish Romans uh, on August the 4th, the first Sunday in August. But we've got a reading guide that outlines every passage, every sermon title between now and then. And so if you don't have one of these, I want to encourage you as you leave, they're at the doors, at every door when you leave. Just grab one and put it in your Bible in a place that you can read along and follow along with us. Maybe even begin to read passages uh, before you come or study them afterwards. Or maybe grab two and use it as a way of inviting someone to come between now and the end of the series to be a part of this important teaching as we walk through uh, maybe one of the most important uh, books, letters in all of the scriptures. And many people have said the chapter that we're in now, just as a reminder, Romans 8, is the most important chapter in all of the Bible. Now that's quite a statement. And as you've been uh, studying with us here, or maybe this is your first time and as you'll hear today, the subject matter, the things that Paul is writing about in chapter 8, will give you an insight into why people have said this is so important. Because in Romans chapter 8, Paul is basically concluding his quote-unquote argument from the first seven chapters of the book. And so Romans 8 is basically Paul saying it's the gospel, the good news of Jesus, that you know, helps us to understand who we are and whose we are. And specifically, we learn two very, very, very important things in Romans chapter 8 that we've talked about so far. I'm going to keep saying this because if you don't get anything else out of this study, I hope you will get this. That Paul says, as Christians, people who are followers of Jesus, those of you who have placed your faith in Christ and you are following Jesus, as Christians, we are not only, most importantly, saved from something, we're saved from condemnation, you remember this? But we're also what? We're saved for something. We're saved from something and we're saved for something. And if you wanted to summarize all of Romans chapter 8, and if you're taking notes today, this is a way to summarize the whole chapter. Paul writes about what we're saved from and what we're saved for, and in that, he summarizes all of the gospel, the good news of Christ. And this is why this is probably the most important chapter in all of the Bible, in understanding the good news of the hope of the gospel. This is why Martin Luther, the great reformer, said this is the pure gospel, where we got our series title from, that we're saved from condemnation. And if you have your scriptures open, I would encourage you to look at verse 1, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. Paul says, therefore... There's no more condemnation for those who belong, underline belong, to Christ Jesus. And we opened up uh, chapter 8 with a whole message on just that one verse, that we're saved from condemnation. It's a legal term. So the gavel hit the desk and the righteous judge, God himself, declared us not guilty, no more condemnation because of the work of Christ. And here's the deal, guys. We, we talked about this. That if that were all Christianity was, that God saved you from condemnation, meaning eternal separation from him and punishment for our open rebellion against God. If that were all there was to Christianity, it would be enough, right? That would be enough. And for many of you, as you've come to Christ through the years, maybe you grew up in a home that talked about Jesus. Maybe you didn't grow up in a home that talked about Jesus. Maybe you're just coming to faith. Maybe you're still exploring what it means to follow Jesus. But for many of us, when we orient ourselves to Christianity, we think about it around this first thing, that we're saved from condemnation. And again, that would be enough. It's a wonderful thing. But many people in their journey with Jesus, their discipleship, their followership of Jesus, they stop there. So it just becomes, I was saved from something. And we talk about that, that there was a moment in time that I crossed from death to life. And it's true when I placed my faith in Jesus. But then many people live like in the rest of life until I go to heaven, I'm on my own. And I just got to kind of try to be a good person and, 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 and do the best that I can. And, and that's where the second part of what it means to be a Christian, what it means to understand and live out the gospel comes into effect that we're saved for adoption. Paul says in verses 2, Romans 8, if you're taking notes, verses 2 and following, all the way to the end of the chapter, including our passage today in 18 through 25. Paul says we're saved for something. And some of you have never realized this, that Jesus didn't just save you from death and separation. Again, that would have been enough, and that's the mercy of God, not getting what you deserve as a rebel against God. But it gets even better. The gospel's even better than that, that God saved you for something. Let let me say it this way. 
God not only loves you to save you from condemnation, and some of you really need to hear this, and some of you watching online, you need to hear this, that God saved you for something, adoption, because he not only loves you, but he likes you. God likes you. He wants to be with you. He wants to have a, a living, real relationship with you. He wants you to be at his table, which we'll celebrate today, and, and understand your identity and your belonging in Christ. That's why Paul uses that word twice in verses 1 and 2. There's no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus because God wants us to belong, and he wants us to be his son. He wants us to be his daughter. And again, for some of you, if you don't get anything else out of today and the whole study, I hope you'll get this, and I do hope you'll get more. But if you don't get anything else, I hope you'll get this, that the gospel not only saves you from condemnation, that's God's mercy, but the gospel saves you for adoption, and that's God's grace. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. And we didn't deserve to be sons and daughters of God. But because of Jesus and what we celebrated last week in the resurrection, that we still live in the light of the resurrection this week, we enjoy not only freedom from condemnation, but we enjoy uh, being a part of God's family, that we were adopted for a relationship with God, to belong and to be with him. And that brings us to the context, which is really important, that we're saved from and saved for, to our passage today. And we're looking at verses 18 through 25. And again, if you have your scriptures, I want to encourage you to open them there. And I just want to offer again, if you need a copy of the scriptures, we have them at each door, a study Bible, and I want to invite you to take one. If you don't have a study Bible, I want to encourage you to grab one because you're going to get commentary and notes as you study the scriptures and as you dig deeper. And that's my encouragement to each of you and to read along with our passages and to study these passages for yourself. And as we get to our passage today in verses 18 through 25, I want to start with verse 17. Because in the context of being saved from and being saved for, Paul writes these words in verse 17. And since we are God's children, we're his children, we are his heirs. In other words, we're adopted, we're, we're, we're saved for adoption. We're his children, we're his heirs. And this is mind blowing. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. But if we share in his glory, we must also share in his suffering. So, Paul cements here the fact that we're saved for adoption. And not only are you a, this is crazy, not only are you a son or daughter of God, but you're a co-heir with the son Jesus. So in other words, now that we're adopted in the family of God, Jesus is our big brother who came for us on behalf of the family and adopted us, made adoption possible through his death and resurrection to belong to Jesus. And now we're co-heirs with Christ. And Paul reminds us in verse 17, which is the setup for our passage today, 18 through 25, that if, that, that if all of this is true, and it is, then we share in the glory of God, but we also share in the sufferings of Christ. And I want to say this, because many people have co-opted the truth of the gospel, what we're hearing in Romans, with their own variation or their own interpretation or I would say their own perversion of what the gospel really is. And one of those perversions is something known as the prosperity gospel. And prosperity is, is, a, is, a, is a very difficult, to me, very destructive way of understanding the truth of what we're hearing today. And it basically in summation is that if you're just faithful and you have enough faith and you do all the right things, then all, you know, life will go well for you. But if you don't, you know, give and you don't dress the right way, you don't look the right way, and you don't have enough faith, then life will go badly for you. And then we read a passage like this. And to me, prosperity gospel preachers have to call in sick for this passage. Because Paul clearly says that our big brother will share in his glory, but will also share in his suffering. That that's normative that you should expect to suffer in this broken world because of the cause of brokenness and sin, because of persecution against Christians that was happening in the context, by the way, of the Roman church. Paul's writing to a real group of people, again, just like us, who have jobs and relationships, their parents, their children, they have diseases, they have frustrations, and on top of all that are experiencing immense persecution from the government. Now, we might experience pockets of that, but different places around the world experience the same persecution that the Romans were experiencing. And what is that? 
Well, death was happening, arrests were happening, beatings were happening, people would lose their jobs because of their faith in Jesus. And specifically in the context, historically, just so you know, the man that was in charge, the emperor at the time, Caesar himself, was a man named Nero. Nero came into power in AD 54. He succeeded a man named Claudius. Claudius was the emperor that kicked out all the Jews from Rome in AD 49. Why did he do that? Because they were monotheistic. They believed in the one true God. And ergo, they didn't believe that Caesar was God. And that was a problem for Claudius. So he kicked all of them out of Rome. And by the way, this is the context that Paul meets a man named Priscilla and his wife Aquila. Because Priscilla and Aquila lived in Rome. And they had to relocate to Corinth. And it's in Corinth that they team up with Paul. And they become wonderful members of his team. More on that some other time. That God used brokenness and persecution to still accomplish his will. And he still does today. But Claudius passes away. And a 16-year-old named Nero comes into power. Any of you have 16-year-olds? Yeah. Okay. And then give them the most power in all of the world. It's a disaster. And Nero uh, persecutes the church like no other emperor has before. So the church is facing terrible persecution. And then a fire breaks out in Rome. And instead of taking responsibility for it, for, for many different reasons of which it actually occurred, Nero chooses to use the church as a scapegoat. They're the ones that caused this fire. So the persecution does what? It goes even higher. People were being burned alive on the stake. Rome was being lit at night with the bodies of Christians. Christians were being thrown into the Colosseum to be consumed by lions and other wild beasts. This was the type of environment that they were living in. And put that into the context of what we're hearing today in verses 17 and following, where Paul says we have to share also in the sufferings of Christ. Because they're asking the question, which is the question, don't you think? Is all of this worth it? I mean, is it really worth it to call myself a Christian? I mean, when the heat really gets turned up, and guys, one day it might for us too. When the pressure really rises, when I face arrest or the loss of my job or I don't get the promotion or even death itself, which many Christians, brothers and sisters, are facing around the world today, is it really worth it to call myself a Christian to live the way that God wants me to live in light of the resurrection that we celebrated last week, to live as a son or daughter of God, an adopted son or daughter of God, is it really worth it all? And this is what Paul wants to answer for us, don't you see, in verses 18 through 25. Is it worth it? And he frames the question in verse 18. Listen to it again. He says, yes, what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. So Paul gives away his answer to, is it worth it, right here in verse 18. If you're taking notes, he says emphatically, yes. Because what we're suffering now and experiencing, and here's the thing, I don't know exactly what you're suffering. I don't know what that looks like in your life today, for those of you here, for those of you watching online, but I know you're suffering. And why do I know that? Because Jesus told us that we would suffer in this world. We would suffer in this world just as humanity, but we would suffer in this world also on top of that as Christians, as followers of his. This is why Jesus says, you gotta take up your cross. What was a cross? A symbol and a mechanism of execution and follow me. You've gotta die to yourself to actually live. Dying to self is difficult, isn't it? I've gotta give up my way, as we talked about in Experiencing God and choose God's way every single day. And oftentimes the world does not only not understand it, but the world is actively coming against it. And here's the thing, everyone watch this. If you're living for Jesus, you can expect persecution. You can expect resistance. You take a stand for Jesus in your house, in your marriage, at work, you should expect resistance. And so if you live with the garbage of prosperityism, that if I live for Jesus and I do all these things for Jesus, then it's some kind of celestial quid pro quo, and God is obligated just to quote unquote bless me, and everything has to go the way that I want it to go, you don't understand the gospel. You don't understand the scriptures. This is why this is so important. Because believe me, you're going to meet 
Christians, people who claim to follow Jesus, that believe this nonsense. And we have to come back to the truth of what Paul is saying. And we have to come back to the truth of the narrative of the scriptures. Guys, all of the disciples minus John were killed for their faith. Do you think they were prosperity preachers? How did that work out for them? And John was just beaten as an old man and exiled in the middle of nowhere. The church at Rome, the church that this letter was originally written to, is experiencing extreme pressure, as we talked about. They're asking the question, is all this really worth it? And Paul himself, of course, was executed where? In Rome. He writes this letter, the letter to the, to the church at Rome in AD 57. He's executed sometime between 63 and 65 right in Rome, near the time that Peter himself was executed in Rome. And all of these guys died believing what we're hearing today and telling us what to expect as followers of Jesus. I just want to encourage you, if you're facing the winds of resistance today, whether it's in your workplace, it's in a relationship, financially or whatever, and it's because you're living by the values and the principles that God has called you to, take heart. We should expect resistance. We're not living in the story of the world. But many of us today that are in the middle of that have a gnawing question inside, which is, I'm trying to live for Jesus. I'm trying to do the right thing in my life. I'm trying to do the things that God's asked me to do as his son or his daughter and live up to my family name. But it's hard. And as I experience brokenness, as I experience loss, for some of you, you're experiencing suffering in your bodies, disease. For some of you, you've experienced the painful loss of a loved one. And you're wondering, is all of this really worth it? And this is what Paul says in verse 18. It is worth it. And why is it worth it? Because of the future. Paul points to the future to answer the question about the present. And isn't it true for many of us in our journey, when we think about where we're going, it makes the road trip worth it. Paul says when it gets uncomfortable, when it gets difficult, remember where all this is going. Remember what the end of the story actually is. And by the way, we as followers of Jesus know the end of the story. We know the story of Jesus and the story of redemption and how all this ends. And Paul is reminding the church that he's reminding you of that today in your present. Again, I don't know what you're going through, but I know you're going through something or you're getting ready to go through something or you just came out of something. That's the reality. And Paul says it's worth it because of what is to come. Listen to this, okay? If you're taking notes, I just want to encourage you to write down three simple things that Paul teaches us from Romans 8, 18 through 25. I'm, I'm begging you to write this down. Because if you're not in suffering and disappointment and discouragement and disease and brokenness that the churches in, in AD 57 when, the, when this is written, you, you will be. And you need to come back to this passage and you need to come back to this truth that Paul is saying and answering the question, is it worth it? And he answers it in three ways. In verses 19 through 25, he's going to give us three reasons why it's worth it to follow Jesus, especially in our sufferings that we share in with Christ. And the first thing he says is that our adoption, again, we're saved from and we're saved for. We're saved for adoption to be God's son and his daughter, welcomed into his family as co-heirs with Jesus. And he says that adoption, look at the, the verbiage in verse 19, is going to be revealed in the future. When we join Jesus after our death or when Jesus returns, if it's during our lifetime, our adoption as sons and daughters of God will be revealed. Now, what does this mean? Well, it means that we're going to be given a new body, and our new body will match the body, the resurrected body of Jesus. It will be beautiful and dazzling in glory. And it will be evident to all people that we belong to God. Because our bodies will stand in stark contrast to those who are not children of God. And so Paul paints the picture that one day you'll be given a resurrection body. This is why he uses the language in 2 Corinthians 5.17 that you're a new creation in Christ. That the old things have passed away and behold the new has come. And he writes further that that renewal is happening inwardly. And that our bodies are decaying and passing away but we're being renewed from the inside day by day. 
But what he's talking about here in this first promise of future glory is that in that day, it'll be evident not just on the inside of, of, of us being a beautiful person and being followers of Jesus and God renewing us on the inside, but it'll be evident on the outside. We're going to do a series in January and February of next year. So you got you to stick with me, okay? And you got to come back. But we're going to talk about heaven. Heaven isn't preached on enough, in my opinion. We should know where we're going as much as we can. There's mysteries about heaven that we don't know. But there's many things in the scriptures about the place that God has gone, that Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go, I'll come and return that where I am, may, you may also be. That's heaven. And we'll talk about that together. And Paul paints the picture of heaven and specifically the outward appearance that we'll have in a resurrected body that will be evident to all and what it will mean for us that no more disease, no more pain, no more death in these bodies. Dallas Willard said it this way, the great theologian and philosopher, he said that death reveals what's happening now inside for every person. That death is just a final step in revealing what was already happening inside. For Christians, those who are being renewed by the Spirit, who are becoming more like Jesus, death seals who, are, who we are becoming. For those who are not followers of Jesus, death seals the choice to reject Jesus and continue in rebellion, and that will become evident for all. Uh, Jen and I were talking about John Mark Comer's new book, Practicing the Way, and we're reading it together, and I would highly encourage you to do so. And in practicing the way, John Mark is giving a, an understanding of discipleship, the, the journey and process of becoming more like Jesus. And he frames it up in our being, in our becoming, in our doing. But the truth is, and, and, and John Mark says this, that so many people in, in our world today, we, we're known for what we do. Like we ask each other, what is it that you do? And it's not a bad question, but we're just, what is it that you produce? What is your job? What is it that you do? Or we identify people for what they have done. What is it that you do? What is it that you've done? But we don't often talk about who we are becoming. The most important thing in our union with Christ, are we becoming more like Jesus? Are we being, as the Bible says, conformed more into the image of our big brother? Do we, to use this phrase, do we bear more of a family resemblance to God as the years go by? And this is the discipleship journey that God is molding and crafting us. And our part, by the way, in the discipleship process is surrender, is yielding to the work of the Spirit and what God wants to do in our life. And surrender is not easy, is it? Yielding to someone else, submitting to someone else is not easy. But that's our part, submitting to the will of God to conform us into his image. And this is what Paul is saying, that one day all of that will be revealed on the outside for all to see. But it gets even better. He says in verses 20 through 22, in answering the question, is it really worth it? And he says, well, if you knew the future, if you knew what awaits you, that one day it will be evident to all that you're a child of God. Your adoption will be clear for everyone to see. But also he says, secondly, that nature will join in our freedom as sons and daughters of God. What does that mean? Verses 20 through 22. Look at it again with me. Paul says, against its will, against whose will? Creation, nature, against its will, verse 20, all creation was subjected to God's curse. But with eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. For we know that all creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up until the present time. What does this mean? Paul is saying that on that day that Christ returns or we go to him, on that day in future glory, nature itself, creation itself will join us and restoration and freedom from the bondage of brokenness of sin. Maybe you've never thought about this. But when Adam and Eve sinned in Genesis chapter 3 and sin entered into the world, and now it enters into all of our bodies from birth, that we have a lineage of brokenness, and moreover, we participate in that brokenness. So you say, well, that's not fair. Well, we're born with a sin nature, but guess what? Each of us participates in that sin nature too. 
we make active choices to rebel against God. But maybe you've never thought about creation has been subjected to the conclusions of Genesis 3 and the sin that came into the world. In other words, creation is in bondage itself to death and destruction. The world is not operating the way that God intended it to. And that's not just with people, it's with nature itself. Remember, God created everything in the world. And it was good. And it was for his glory. It displayed his creativity and his splendor. And one day, Paul says, in future glory, the world itself, creation, will be restored back to its original intent. It'll give glory to God. It'll be dazzling and beautiful. We get glimpses of that now with a sunrise or a mountain vista or uh, standing on the beach. We get glimpses of the glory of God. But we also see the destruction of nature. And we call it natural disasters. But according to Romans 8, there's nothing natural about it. This is not what God intended for nature. So when we see the destruction of hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and fires and lightning, all of those things are a product of brokenness, of sin. They weren't intended to harm or cause destruction. And moreover, creation itself is meant to display God's glory. Go back to Romans 1. Paul says people are without excuse because they can look around them in creation itself and see that God exists. Tomorrow we'll experience together a natural phenomena. We'll, we'll see an eclipse. And people will look heavy, you know, upward into the sky. So hopefully you'll have glasses before you do that. And they'll see this thing. But people, and this is a great prayer for us, will be reminded that God made the heavens and the earth. That, that God created the sun and the planets and the stars and all of the different things and ordered them. This is why we know we'll have another eclipse in 20 years. Because we know things operate with order. But we also see the chaos of the world. I was reading a New York Times article yesterday about the eclipse. I thought this was fascinating in, in light of our text today. And how creation itself is longing for renewal. But creation is also the evidence of God's existence. As David declared in Psalm 19 verse 1, The heavens declare your glory, God, and the world is your handiwork. So as people look at nature tomorrow and are reminded, they're also reminded of, of God. The New York Times article was interviewing someone and they said about the eclipse, I'm not a spiritual person. Interesting. Everyone's a spiritual person. I'm not a spiritual person. I don't usually think about the bigger picture of what we're all swimming in. But I felt that the last eclipse, this sense that I'm this one person in this huge thing, and I realized how big the world really is. The article went on to say, most of our communal enthusiasms these days are human-made, the Oscars, the Super Bowl, the Final Four, the election, the new Beyonce album. A total solar eclipse is a product of the natural world. It happens without elaborate stagecraft, nothing we could do, no outlay of capital, and for that reason alone, it is a rare occurrence. The article was interviewing this one person and she went on to say, I'm hoping to leave the eclipse this year with a deep sense that we aren't in control of everything. Fascinating. And that that's okay that we're not in control. Because sometimes the things that we're not in control of are really beautiful. It's not just all of the bad things. It's interesting to get a glimpse, a view of someone who's experiencing something in creation that's pointing back to a deep spiritual truth. And the truth is, guys, and the reason why I say we're all spiritual is we're all being formed spiritually, whether you participate that or not. You're all being formed into a worldview and an understanding, whether you're being formed into the image of Christ through his truth or the truth of the stories of this world. And the point is that creation itself will join in the revelation that we're under the bondage of sin now, but God wants to free us from that, and creation will be freed from that. And when that happens, frustration, which is the word groaning there, if you're following the scriptures, just circle it. it you, Paul uses that word uh, for creation, that creation groans and that believers groan. And next week we'll talk about the groaning of the Holy Spirit. 
You say, wow, that's a lot. But like, what does that mean? What does that word mean? It's a weird word. The word means frustration. That creation is frustrated because we don't yet fully see the glory of God. Believers are frustrated because we don't yet see the evidence of our adoption fully in our bodies. And that the Holy Spirit groans in frustration for what will be. And so Paul says, on the day that creation joins us in our freedom, all of that will be evident. Here's the third thing. Paul writes that there's a now and a not yet. Verse 23 through 25. Meaning, we see the evidence of God's redemption, him saving us from condemnation and for adoption now. We can see it now, but there's a whole not yet. There's things that are yet to come. The example that he gives here is that we've been given the Holy Spirit. Look at the passage, verse 23. That the Holy Spirit is a deposit. That's the, the, the language Paul uses in Ephesians and Romans. That God puts down a, think about with your house or your car, you put a, a down payment or a deposit on something that you're going to one day fully own. And the Holy Spirit comes into our lives the moment we receive Christ. And he becomes a, a seal of our, for our day of redemption, a down posit, a, a, a first payment, as Paul describes it, of the first fruits of a harvest of righteousness to come. What does all this mean? It means that the Holy Spirit, if you're a follower of Jesus, resides in you now, never to leave you or forsake you, to guide you and teach you, to comfort you, to convict you when you're not living the way that God wants you to live. But also, don't miss this, the Holy Spirit seals you for the day of redemption. It's like a stamp on an envelope. You can't get it off. God has marked you and sealed you as a son or daughter of his. And that's why we believe in the assurance of salvation that even if we doubt or we reject, that God doesn't reject us. Some people struggle with that. And they say, well, what if I reject God? What if I change my mind? God doesn't change his mind about you. Every disciple fell away, but they were still God's children. Jesus restored each of them, including Peter himself, that he said, I'm going to build the church on your type of faith, Peter. So we see the assurance of our salvation with the sealing of the Holy Spirit. But there's also a reminder that we haven't yet seen the full evidence of our adoption as sons and daughters. What does this mean? It means that, you know, the day that you become a parent, to use that example, because he talks about childbirth and the pain of childbirth and labor, which I can't speak to experientially, but I saw three different times. And the moment that child is laid on their, uh, on their, their mom's chest and they hug them and see them for the first time, it's worth it, the pain of it and the suffering of it. And Paul says it's like taking that child home as a mom or dad. And I remember when we took our first home, he's in the room right now. And I remember thinking, someone should stop us. We're not prepared for this. We don't know what we're doing. We're going to break this. We don't, we don't understand it. And the truth is, on that day, we were fully a mom and a dad. But we didn't fully know what we were doing. And we still don't. And we remind our kids all the time, we, you didn't come with a manual. So we're learning, and we have to have grace with one another. What's the point? That on that day, you were a mom or a dad but you're becoming more and more of a mom and dad. The, the first day of your job, think about your job right now on the first day, you might have been given a title as a principal or an engineer or the president or the vice president or the head of sales or the lead architect or whatever your industry might be. And that was your title, you are that person. But did you know everything? No. And the truth is, the longer you're in that seat and the longer that you lead and the more you do that, you gain more competency and confidence and you become more of that. Again, we underestimate who we're becoming. We don't think about that. But we're all becoming something. And what Paul is saying is you're becoming more like Christ as you yield to him. And on that day of redemption, you will fully know all of your rights as a son or daughter. You'll fully experience what you impart now, the now and the not yet. And in the meantime, he tells us in verse 25, this is how we have to wait. Last thing here, verse 25. He says, we wait for what's to come, and we answer the question, is it worth it? Yes. And we do so with what? Two things. Verse 25. With patience and with confidence. And this is where Paul says, as followers of Jesus, you can be confident. You can be com confident that God is coming for you that he's preparing a place for you, that the best lies ahead for you. In fact, bottom line today, Romans 8, 18 through 25, for Christians, our best day lies ahead of us. 
And there will be a day, one day, when all of our painful days will lie forever behind us. For sons and daughters of God, for Christians, our best days lie ahead of us. And one day, all of our painful days and suffering will lie behind us. And until that time, God reminds us that he's with us, never to leave us, never to forsake us. And we enjoy things like the table that we're going to celebrate right now as followers of Jesus. Because the table is meant to be a reminder of who you are and whose you are, of your identity and your belonging in Jesus. That the things that Paul is saying about our future glory are true. Remember David said in Psalm 23, you prepare a table in the presence of my enemies. What does that mean? It, it means you, you create a safe place that you remind me where I belong that I'm yours, that I'm your son, that I'm your daughter. And even in the midst of a lot of enemies that surround me, I have a place of comfort and respite and the hope of future glory. And that's what the table is, that Jesus gives this to us and we celebrate it today in the presence of our great enemy, Satan himself, and many other enemies that come against and persecute our faith and we're reminded of who we are and whose we are in Christ, that we're saved from condemnation and saved for adoption, sealed by the Holy Spirit forever. I want to invite you just to, uh, to pray with me and to consider what you've heard today and to prepare your hearts to come to the table. The Bible says we should prepare ourselves to come to the table. And so I want to invite you just for a few moments to pray. If there's something that you need to confess before the Lord in light of what you've heard today, something you brought into the room against someone else or against God, that you would confess that and you would make that right in your heart before you come to the table. So let's pray together now.